our next speaker, Perry Hewitt, is something of an enigma. She, uh, she hates cycling, and hates me because of cycling. Um, and at the same time, she has turned herself into a completely different woman when she bought herself a Peloton. And she bought herself a Peloton because the experience of the entire product design appealed to her. It was a beautiful experience, and she's now become a, an advocate of it. And this tells you a little bit about who Perry is. She's, she's part designer, but she's also part evangelist. And she brings a really thoughtful, interesting, and sometimes cynical part of the conversation to what we should be doing as designers in the world today. She's currently at the Lincoln Center driving their engagement, and I'd like to welcome Perry Hewitt. I'm all that stands between you and lunch, and I'm very cognizant of that fact. <laughs> I'm also cognizant of the fact that I've never landed a single triple axle, much less 10 in a row, but I'm not bad with people. People, product, process, and pixels is sort of where I've made my game. And hippo wrangling is one of the things I'd like to think I'm good at and would like to make you all better at at the end of this session. So hippo wrangling, or stakeholder management, is never easy. It's a combination of art and science that involved in keeping executive leadership focused on the big picture without getting too mixed up in the product, which is all of your business. Luckily or unluckily, I've been wrangling hippos for quite a while. This is way pre-Peloton. This is you know, my factory career. Um, I'll start by taking you back to the 1990s when I worked in Europe for a trading company that did a lot of business with factories in the former Soviet Union. It was a really crazy time. It was the fall of the wall, new business and technology springing up everywhere. Lots of progress and a lot of change. Some of these factories existed in places that were called monotowns, places like Bielaya Tserkov in Ukraine or Taliadi in Russia. Does anyone know what Taliadi is famous for? Anyone? A lot of cars. A lot of cars are the cars that populated the roads in the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe from the 1970s until the 2000s. And it was, it was quite a production. But in these towns, these monotowns, the factory is the town. A monotown meant that the guys, and they were all guys who ran the place, it was like a negative advertorial for the Me Too movement back in the 90s. Um, yeah, they ran the place where they were responsible for everything. It wasn't just like the factory and the processes and the products that came out of it. It was the people and the hospitals and the food supply and the education. It was the whole thing. These were the ultimate hippos, the ultimate highest paid person's opinion, because they had all the authority in the town. So my job, in part, was to work with these monotown managers to change how some of our processes worked. So get back this one. Um, these men had some strong opinions which being responsible for all aspects of a town of hundreds of thousands of people can do for you. They were charged with stewarding the ultimate big picture, but sometimes, unsurprisingly, they could get stuck in the details, involving changing how we communicated from this telex machine, which was, believe it or not, kind of amazing for its time, to the marvels of 1990s email. As you can imagine, people had opinions about this transition. So this is how we sort of communicated between the factories and the monotowns, the offices in London, the offices in Kiev, the offices in Almaty, and we had to make a big change involving technology. And I had to work on strategies that got these guys focused back on what they were supposed to do, run the entire town, and not become obsessive about the communications products we were trying to introduce. So whether you're talking about Soviet factory heads in the 1990s or thought leader CEOs today, I'd say the game is more or less the same. The title of this workshop refers to a CEO or a president or a CMO sitting next to a guy on a plane. Or maybe it was a digital conference for the cartoon here. I love that like, there's 100 changing priorities once your CMO goes to a digital conference. So that's a pretty good, pretty good statement about uh, what happens when they come back, right? Um, you know, it could be a conference talking to his nephew who's really into computers. I got that one a lot. But bottom line, in one of these encounters, they got wind of a new technology, a bright and shiny object they'd like to see worked into your product. So this presentation is about how you manage up, how you defend the user experience of your product from the pernicious hippo. There are many ways to approach product stewardship in the face of executive involvement. 
These are the ones I've seen be most effective, getting education on the agenda, defining the swim lanes, feeding your executive team, proactively feeding, not running from or delivering on demand, a regular manageable data diet, creating a safe space for experimentation, and most importantly, perhaps speaking so you can be heard. Not on this list, you will see, backing down, shoulder shrugging, or hand wringing. Software leadership is the future of virtually all organizations, and it's your opportunity as experienced designers to step up and future-proof the place you work. I'll lead with one of the most powerful, which may also be my resume. <laughs> Education is the vital component for helping executives understand the work that you do. As long as all you work on, whether you're you know, the UX designer or the product leader, is this mysterious black box with a pretty interface on the front of it, the more your executives will feel emboldened to change that face. You might think that you benefit from the information asymmetry. You know all these bright and shiny new things about how product tech development works with all the knowledge on your end, but that's really playing the short game and not the long game. Here are some of the methods I've seen be most effective in education. Workshops aimed at executives to drive understanding of strategy and process. Radek will speak you know, in part to that later, but how do you spell how leaders understand why prioritization must be flexible and responsible, responsive to the market and why hippos are not as compelling, even though they think they are, as actual customer data? In these sessions, the executives show, see how product team work derives from actual customers and market. Also listen, hear from them how they want ongoing visibility into the product process. Product and feature level storytelling, often fueled by user research. This is a real challenge. I have mixed feelings about, I feel like, you know, I'm an AA or something, hi, I'm Perry, and I have mixed feelings about Agile. But, you know, uh, one challenge I've seen with these two week sprints of Agile is the pace sometimes undertells the story of the process, the progress. Look, there's, there's a lot wrong with it big launch theory of waterfall development and oh my god it's all pinning on this one day two years and one day in the future because that's what we promised the board that's, I get it that that doesn't work really well but what that does really do really well is align people around a narrative of progress and I feel like this is something that often we underdo in organizations in the agile two-week sprint methodology people are busy working on measurable continuous improvement which is great but there's much less of a launch moment to align people around that story for example, if the user research findings are shared at all, too often I see them shared as like a full day invitation to a busy exec or a large unedited, unedited video file passed around. I think there's a real opportunity in the middle in these two week sprints to think about how do we tell the small product and feature level storytelling. Is it a weekly email? Is it a monthly all staff moment? Is it a quarterly show and tell invitation? Find a way to tell those user research small stories. We have all heard the CEO repeat the same damn story of like a customer anecdote over and over and over. It is your job to feed him or her those anecdotes. You can use that impulse to deliver stories executives can understand, own, and share with others. Reverse mentoring pro programs can help executives see some of the behaviors and expectations wrought by digital. In framing some of our digital opportunities with Lincoln Center, that's really, those are the two words I keep coming back to. Don't focus on the technologies, focus on the behaviors and the expectations that the technology hath wrought in our world. And let's not get snide here. These are by and large smart, informed, accomplished people who have, by virtue of generational cohort, have not developed the skills other have. Your job is to bring these execs along with you. Their job is to synthesize information that's coming at them from all these different line and functional areas. And reverse mentoring is one way to help them accelerate their digital learning curve. Define swim lanes for organization and product. If you're in this room following these smart product people's work, you've thoroughly assimilated the concept that your product vision does not necessarily and should not equal your organization's vision. In larger organizations in particular, you likely won't have a product leader CEO. And now it's incumbent upon you to help your executive team see, understand, and live those swim lanes. But how actually can you get this done? Support your product owners in developing their own vision and in articulating with the executive te team how their product vision intersperses and intersects with the overall organizational vision work. But it can't be just a one-off exercise. This is, again, a one-and-done, will-kill-you approach. The product organization vision needs to be restated frequently and shared broadly beyond the product team to marketing who's developing the messaging, to IT who you're partnering with on some of the underlying technologies, 
and even to HR, informing and onboarding new hires. This is one thing I actually see missed a lot, and I know HR works for the company, insert myriad HR jokes here, I will laugh along with you, I promise. However, I do think they are an underutilized partner in the kind of change management that we all need to make, including product teams. The more your peer departments understand how these two visions align, the fewer competing messages and priorities your executives will hear. Feed your executive team a regular and manageable data diet. First of all, does anyone not know what this is from? This is going to be a youth tax implemented on all of you immediately. <laughs> For those of you born after Richard Banfield was able to buy his first drink, um, this is from a movie called This is Spinal Tap. The allure of this particular piece of sound equipment, as the character explains, is that it goes to 11, right? Which is way better than 10. There's no difference in the functionality, just how the data are presented, which in this case informed perception. And while I wouldn't advise an 11 on the dial approach, well, maybe sometimes, it depends on the exec, I would agree that how you serve up the data matters. In addition to being sensibly presented, the product level data you share has to be both regular and manageable. Regular is the delivery mechanism. It means that product level data is regularly on the agenda at C-suite meetings. While the executive team is primarily concerned and should primarily be concerned with the organization-wide view, consider this a health check update on a set of criteria you have mutually defined to be useful for understanding the product progress. As product owners, designers, developers agree on a set of product KPIs to be presented and engaged with. And periodically elicit feedback from that group. Are these product KPIs commonly used and understood the way numbers in the P&L, one would hope, are understood? At JSTOR, the product team focused on revenue, usage, and engagement as an anchor for those most senior team meetings with periodic updates from individual product managers. But those could be reconsidered. You could also look outside in. For example, share of the academic library market or budget could be another metric. Or what percent of features are focused on our content versus focused on our workflow. So different ways to think about what those KPIs are, but getting it regularly on the agenda is vital. Manageable means in a format that makes sense. I have seen and cleaned up a ton of data puke in my tech career. <laughs> this has ranged from when I came to Harcourt Inc. in the year 2000. I said, you know, how's the e-commerce doing? We built this you know, website. It was giant. It had 27,000 SKUs. That was like the biggest thing on the internet in 2000, or at least we thought so. Um, and I said, you know, how, how's it doing? And these sysadmins would come in and print out these dot matrix server logs. And er, 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 you know, there's like a pound of paper on my desk. And say, hey, I heard you want to hear how commerce is doing. Check this out. So that was, you know, that was, that was a state of data puke. And even today, you know, you'll get these slick 2018 vendors in that are selling all these analytics views and new engagement metrics um, that really ignore the internal data realities of how clean they are and what's going on. Data cleansing, analysis, and presentation to the executive suite still has room for improvement, but you've got to focus on what you need are the most important elements so what you deliver can be re reasonably consumed by the audience you're sharing it with. So feed your execs regular and manageable data. By working with the executive team to select and share the right metrics, you've given them a window into your world without opening the door too wide. So create a safe space for experimentation. Let's say you've done all the above. You've created various channels to educate executives on digital and product writ large and what it means to have a product-led culture. You've constructed easy to understand swim lanes between organization vision and goals and product vision and goals. And you fed your executive team a regular but manageable data diet with periodic updates and sort of pulse checks on how that's working. But what if your hippos are still charging? They still want to get their hands dirty in product level decisions. Without disrupting your healthy, user informed, revenue producing product progress with guesses from above, find safe spaces for experimentation. A medium weight version of this experimentation would be a design jam on a product feature your team has been muddling over but has not seen this be pretty successful. So it's something that's already sort of in, in your, on your radar in your pipeline, but not something so baked that you know where it needs to go. Bring execs in for a day to see what that work actually looks like. It's one thing for an exec to ask for a chatbot on every single page of the website, and I've seen that. It's another to participate in defining the user flow and developing hypotheses about good and bad consequences of this decision, and then building the plan for testing these hypotheses through analytics and user research. In organizations with the need and scale to justify a more full-blown effort, 
the safe space for experimentation can look like a, a full labs team. Two examples. At JSTOR, the labs team developed product ideas through workshops that helped us better understand the needs of the customers. Execs felt like they had a new level of visibility into these conversations and helped turn them into white paper insights. They were involved, you know, sort of synthesizing the research into a white paper that then helped them understand the customers better. This made them in turn less likely to look for product changes you know, without deeper consideration. So this is a sort of more medium weight way to do it. The small agile labs team did the work, you know, to work iteratively with the customer on a few features, and then the insights were where the execs got brought in and felt real ownership. And I spent a fair amount of time talking to a senior product manager at Fidelity about their labs approach. You know, the larger for-profits have built labs to evolve their products more nimbly, but also with executive wrangling as a side benefit. So recently, labs was doing some research into why millennials weren't saving as much in 401ks, and shocker, student loan debt was like right up there. Um, but they, they did, through their conversations with young you know, employees trying to wrangle this student loan debt and their, you know, their 401k contributions, they did learn ways to develop it through smaller products to engage these audience. They had a student loans debt tool, which was geared you know, at the, the loan you know, payer. And they also had a student loan employer contribution product they developed as a result, where you're able to pay some of your loans back on a pre-tax basis, which definitely helped with retention of some of the millennials. So I said, how did you do this? Well, you know, how did this help you manage the execs in this process, and how did that work out for you? They said the execs actually lead and participate in the user research themselves. Then the team goes away and synthesizes, reports out the research findings, and participates in early prototyping and user tests. The team works iteratively with about 15 rounds of user testing before deciding what to build for pilot. And the execs attend three to four you know, stage gate uh, presentations to discuss whether to continue the research, to go to pilot, or to shelve the project. So the execs are really brought along the way in the Fidelity Labs project. And the big win is, when it comes to the work of the pro pilot, it's clear that it's time for the product team to take over at that point. There's a very clear handoff from this is where we've engaged the execs in the labs process, and this is where product takes over. Uh, but thanks to their early engagement, there are really no surprises. They're very well informed, and they let the product team really advance and do their thing. But if these medium and heavyweight experimentation spaces feel daunting, if you're in a small shop, if you don't have the resources, it's hard to figure it out, um, the lightest weight way of keeping the execs at bay is to share results of the experiments you are already doing. Again, this is back to that sort of two-week speech. You are great question askers. You are great information gatherers. You need to become storytellers where you're sharing results of those experiments, you know, communicating up to executive leadership just in a regular and consistent way about the kind of testing you're doing on product and summarize how the results inform decisions. Again, I, I consistently see this project where user research is delivering all these results and these decisions take place, but you need sort of, someone said to me, a finger puppets version of telling this story. So think finger puppets when you tie those two things together. Which leads me to my last point, which is that language matters. It's up to you to find a way to communicate. Jargon happens for a reason, I get it, right? We live in a fast-changing world, it's acronym-laden, insidery language feels like it can help us communicate within our community, and you know, it's kind of cool, right? We know what all those letters stand for. And it really can work wonders. I mean, I've seen this, too, on the enterprise side, you know, to our tremendous detriment sometime, where an agency comes in with like a huge shock and awe deck, you know, the acronyms are flying, the ponytails are swishing, the, you know, I mean, it's all, it's all going on. There's a lot of, lot of video, a lot of shock and awe. Um, and it, it does two things. It's really good at eliciting panic and funding, right? And that's kind of what the agency is going for. But it's a poor ongoing approach to engagement for you all as product leaders, user research designers in engaging going on with your executive team. It won't help you support your, ex your product agenda. I got some great mentoring on this during my time presenting to donors and overseers at Harvard. You know, talk about uh, being vulnerable. After one talk, I was really pleased with myself. I thought, God, I, you know, not to like brag, but I kind of nailed that. And someone said to me, well, if you wanted the takeaway, you are really smart about technology, you've achieved that. But if what you wanted was for them to understand and support your initiatives, you failed completely. Harsh but fair. Speak so that you can be understood by more than your equally product and tech obsessed peers. You may have to work hard to understand each other's language, but it's worth the effort. 
If you can explain clearly the value of product leadership and results you're producing, you're going to do two things. You're going to build a bridge of understanding that's not based on momentary excitement, flavor of the month of the new. And you're going to, this is the, really the important one, you're going to enable the executive team to make the case for you about why the way you work the way you work, to the board, to new hires, and to the world. Before you write that memo or give that presentation, consider how you're using language to empower your audience to take the message further and not to show how smart you are. Shock and awe with jargon may win the skirmish, but clear, concise communication will always win the war. So to recap, these are five useful ways to bring your executives along with you on your product leadership journey and to help them keep them out of your day-to-day -day business. Empathy is very much the word of the moment. I think I've heard it four times already this morning, and it really applies here. Your goal is not only to defend your turf from executive incursions, although some days, granted, it certainly feels that way. Your greater goal should be to inform and empower your executive team so that the energy they might have spent meddling with your product, bringing back that bright and shiny idea from the conference, is, and that's motivated either by fear, like put yourself in their shoes. They're saying, is it going well? Is it really going well? I'm not sure I understand how it's going, so I, I better get in here and make the logo bigger. Or is it curiosity? Like just how does that work? I want to learn. Help me understand. So take those impulses and let them redirect into the health of the overall organization first and foremost, and then also to be a champion of your efforts. While this presentation has been largely about what you can do, I recognize the burden is not solely responsible with the user experience designers and the designers and the product folks here in bridging this gap. The boards and the execs have to do their part. Here's the good news. Increasingly, boards are looking for digital and product acumen in organizational leadership. They recognize, as this TechCrunch piece points out, that technical ignorance is not leadership. It's like, you know, I don't do math. Right? It's not really tenable for, you know, I used to interview a lot of folks who you know, say like, oh, my daughter or son is looking for a job in marketing. And, you know, two out of five would come in and say, well, I don't really like numbers, so I figured marketing is a good place to be. No, wrong answer. <laughs> you need to like numbers. And if you're an exec, you need to not, you know, I don't do computers is not tenable. Um, you, but we're in the in-between now, right? When we're sort of transitioning the leadership of these organizations to understand, and both sides need to contribute to the solution. But the real silver lining is you are well positioned to bridge this knowledge gap. As Mr. Neeson would say, you all protest, possess a particular set of skills. As designers and developers and product owners, you are natural persuaders. You're capable of asking the right smart questions. You're capable of synthesizing the answers in a meaningful way. And you're capable of crafting a user experience such that you can bring people along. Your job now is to use those skills for good internally to bring along your executive team. Internal communication is often underattended to, and it's a clear instance where an ounce of prevention, as cumbersome and tedious as it may seem to fast-moving product teams, is worth a pound of cure. All this communication, collaboration, and commitment to education is what will help you wrangle your hippos. It will keep them from asking for that feature they heard about on the plane, at the digital conference, or maybe even from their nephew who's really good with those computers. Thank you very much. Thank you.